All right, so talking about marriage. And what I've really done for this six-week class that we're going to be doing in the fall is we've done a lot of really wonderful marriage classes, some seminars. So we've had some great marriage you know, weekends and people come in. And for the past 15 years or so, you know, I've been hosting or at all of them. And so I've stolen all the best stuff, and, uh, and which is what preachers do. And so uh, when, in fact, one of my mentors once said, nah, the definition of an original preacher story or preacher idea is I forgot the source. And so <laughs> it's kind of true. So anyway, we're going to go through some of that. One of my favorite marriage quotes ever. And in fact, if you only take one thing away from this, okay, this is the overarching critical point that best sums up what I'm trying to say. So here's my favorite marriage quote. <laughs> marriage, an endless sleepover from your favorite weirdo. With your favorite weirdo. I mean, that's especially true for my wife, Carol. She, she definitely has an endless sleep, sleepover with her favorite. At least I'm her favorite weirdo, and she's okay with that. But it's true. People are weird. Your spouse is weird. You are weird. You are weird. And how we deal with these strange differences, you know, these expectations that we bring into the marriage, how do we deal with them? What do we do with our marriage expectations? Should we have expectations? Should we have a lot of expectations? Or is there such a thing as too many expectations? We all come into marriage with some great expectations. And as Christians, and especially if you grew up in the church and you were taught and mentored, or you grew up in a Christian family, you know some great ideals of principles of marriage and you have expectations. So we're gonna, that's a good thing. We all might also have some expectations that we think everybody has the same expectations, but you get married and you figure out, you know, my spouse does not have the same expectations. What do you know? Once my wife told me, I, I, can say, I won't say what, what it was about, but she said, why can't you just think about it like I think about it? Because <laughs> well, I don't on that thing. So we can dig into that tonight a little bit, uh, dealing with these expectations. And the first thing I want to tell you to do is to ask the Lord to help you with any marriage myths and unhealthy expectations you might bring into the marriage. Notice that the fo focus here is on yourself. It'd be very tempting for me to go through some of this stuff and you'd go, yeah, my wife, my husband need, needs to deal with that. You know, now think about yourself, okay? And so dealing with our own marriage myths. Here's a few. Here's one marriage myth. All you need is love. The Beatles made great music, but that is a lie, <laughs> right? That's a lie. Uh, another great uh, myth, you complete me. Or how about a myth of, you know, differences will ruin your marriage if you're, too, if you're not alike enough. Or a myth of happy couples must do everything together. Or happy couples don't argue and fight. Not true. How about every disagreement has a resolution? That's a myth. How about never go to bed angry? Now, we've got, we've got scripture for that, right? Don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? That scripture is not talking about you can't go to sleep if you're upset at your spouse. I'm telling you that. Now, it means, of course, don't let your anger fester and, and make embitter you inside you. But I guarantee you, if you're having one of those discussions with your spouse and it rolls around at 3 a.m., it may be very wise for you to say, honey, can we just do this again? Can we pick this up tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow night? Because I'm exhausted and I got to get up at 6 a.m. to go to work. Now, you, what you can't do, what's just a little tip, what's not fair is you can't say, okay, I can't talk, have this discussion anymore. I'm done. And end of story. And it's kind of some fuzzy, like, we, maybe we'll talk about it some other time or the next time we have a fight. No, you can say, though, hey, can we set a time to reconvene and talk about this again? I'm just, I, I'm, I'm exhausted right now. How many of you have had, no, don't raise your hand, actually, but I will, because you, especially if your spouse is in here, don't raise your hand. Uh, you know, you, you've had that, like, just crazy bad argument. It rolls around at 2 a.m., and you keep going because you think, oh, we're going to fix this now. And then by the time 5 a.m. comes around, you're just like, I'm, oh, boy, I'm, yeah, it's just, it doesn't help. So there's something. How about this myth? Name calling is normal. No, it's not. You shouldn't do it. How about your true love will instinctively, automatically know what to say and do to make you happy? What about it's your spouse's job to make you happy? No. How about your spouse can meet and fulfill all your needs? A myth. And, and we could name many more, but we really all come with two things we need to sort out in our own head and heart. And, and again, the, the work, the homework is for you to do on yourself. One is think about the marriage myths you might be believing and where did you pick them up? Correct them. 
But second, examine your expectations, okay? And, ha- and, and I have some really good news, okay? We're going to spend some time now talking about examining our expectations. You can go to the next slide, even. We have some research. Counselors conducted a survey asking husbands and wives separately, what are your top needs that you'd like to communicate to your spouse? And this is great because the wives, they kind of accumulated their answers. Let's put those up. A lot of the wives' answers were like this. Listen to her. Help her. Protect her. Romance her. Take her out on a date. Honor and cherish her. Share your heart. Appreciate her. Recognize her. Lead her spiritually. Give her affection. These are what the wives are wanting. Now, guys, don't go to the next slide because, guys, you might want, seriously, there's no shame in getting out your phone and taking a picture of this right now because it could save you. It could be so great. So feel free to do that. Um, so that's, you know, what the wife said. And, uh, you know, that's a wonderful list. And then, as you might imagine, the guy's list was a little different. Just a little. So let's put the question back up again. But they said, what are your needs? And the guy said first, show up naked and bring food. That was the guy's top need in marriage. I promise that's, that's as PG-13 as we get here tonight, okay? So it's okay. I don't see any, well, it's just a few kids. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, got, you can sort that out later. Send, send the counseling bill to the church. Uh, and so, okay, honestly, though, we have different expectations. And even the traditional guy, girl, tip, you know, stereotypical things, you will find as you get into your marriage and into getting to know others, it's not, those, those I mean, there's, there's some general things where that kind of hold true sometimes about men and women, but but those are overgeneralizations because it doesn't apply to everyone. And, and in fact, you're not just a girl. You're not just a guy. You're you. And you have what you came into the marriage with expectations or hopes and dreams and plans and, and desires. And it probably comes from your personality. It comes from your experience of what you experienced maybe, you know, growing up, either good or bad. It comes from what you've seen or what you just kind of it could come from a dream you had. Like, I want to have a marriage like this. I want to live in a little cottage in the Cotswolds and, you know, whatever it might be. That's your, your thing and that's okay. So you need to honestly ask yourself, what am I expecting from my spouse and from my marriage? And take that question to the Lord. Ask the Lord to help you sort out what's healthy, what's unrealistic, maybe what's downright wrong, right wrong about my expectations. Am I expecting something that's just wrong? I could be. Maybe something, what, what Lord is... What my expectations do I have in marriage and family that maybe it would be nice, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not in the cards for me. For well, because life, right? And and I need to crucify that and let go of it. Deal with it within yourself and with God and be ready to confess anything to your spouse that needs to be confessed that the Lord shows you. You've been putting too much expectations on that, and that's not your spouse isn't going to give you that. Only God can give you that, for example. One marriage course says you should draw a circle around yourself and work on everything inside that circle. All right. Doesn't mean you can't, you know, point out when your spouse hurts you and we'll get into that next week and things like that. But, but really the more we focus on my, I focus on my own issues and deal, the better it works out in our marriage. And then I can sort out how to, what's the difference, for example, in making a healthy request and a destructive demand based on some desire or expectation I have. And we'll get to that. But when it comes to marriage, we all have this box, okay? We're going to get the box here. This box of hopes, dreams, and desires, okay? And inside it, we've got all these hopes and dreams and desires we had. And we have. And it can change over time even. They may be unspoken, but I've got my box. And the thing that to take note of is you've got your box and I've got my box. And it may be undefined. It may even be subconscious. But I've got my box of what I think marriage should be or what I want out of marriage, or what my dream of a marriage is, okay? And so I've got a box, you've got a box, and we need to know what's in our spouse's box. And this is the great mystery. Guys, this is what we've been trying to figure out for a long time. What's in that box? Well, here's the blessing, folks. Marriage is the lifelong journey of getting to discover what's in that box. And you can let it frustrate you to no end. Because, well, it's different than my box. Well, guess what it is? If we were all the same, it'd be a pretty boring world. But you got married because you recognized there were things about your future spouse or potential spouse 
that you knew this is a, a great quality that really attracts me and probably compliments me. But even those complimentary things can become grating over time, right? Well, now why don't they think like me? Because they're not a clone of you. They just compliment you. And so they've got stuff in their box that you need to learn. And you've got stuff in your box. So let's think about some of these things. This is where it gets fun. How about money? If only money just fell from the sky like that, right? We'd be fine. We've all got ideas about what... Now I'm going to slip on some of these now. This was a bad idea. You have hopes and dreams, you know, about money. Are you going to have a lot of money? Do you just need a little bit of money? You're going to live on love. It's a big issue. Will one part spouse work or both of you? Will we have a budget? Will we follow the budget? <laughs> How much will we spend? How much will we save? You have ideas and dreams about money and your married life and in your future. What about chores? you got some ideas, maybe from your own family of origin, maybe from things you've seen about how the chores will get done, okay? So who's going to clean, okay? Who's, who's going to clean? Now, who's going to do that, right? All right? Uh, someone messed with my box. Oh, who's going to clean, <laughs> right? Uh, let me root around in my box here and find who's going to fix stuff. Who's going to fix stuff, right? Who's going to fix stuff? Right, right, right. It's, it's real. The struggle is real. Okay, so we've got some ideas about chores. What about the house? Where's my house? It fell apart. Oh no! All right, y'all don't look. I got to do some house repair. So I got to fix some stuff. <gasps> my house is held together with blue electrician's tape because I didn't want to glue it. All right, you got a house. Where will you live? Now, guys, unfortunately, there might be a good amount of time that you spend in this house, this little doggy house here. But if you listen really well tonight, you might minimize that time. Uh, but, you know, we've got an idea of what kind of house we want, what we desire, where, where are we going to live, that kind of stuff. Okay, car. Okay, here's another one. What about, what about your dream car? Let me find my dream car. We have our hopes and dreams about that. Let me see. What do we got here? Oh, yeah. Will it be the sports car? Or will you need to do something a little more practical? Right? How about children? Oh, yeah, Children. You probably have hopes and dreams about a child. Are you an only child? Or did you have a bunch of siblings growing up? Having a bunch of children, siblings, maybe it makes you want to have a lot of kids. Maybe it makes you want to be an only child. I don't know. But uh, are you only? Or, you know, you want to have two. How many do you want to have? Maybe you had two boys and you want to have a girl. You try for the girl. And then it's not a boy, so you try for another girl, right? Maybe you decide you just want to have your own basketball team, right? You can do that. You can do that. Okay. So, yeah, that's children. We all have hopes and dreams about kids. Guess what? It sometimes doesn't work out the way you think it will. Carol and I prayed for a child for 13 years, and God finally was good and blessed us with a child. And it's probably, at this point, it seems pretty sure it's the only one we're going to get unless Abraham's situation comes up. But uh, <laughs> we're, we're thankful to God. But, you know, I know people who they, they don't get that yes answer or whatever. So, or, or, or they get the uh, opposite answer, and it's way, way more than they plan. You, hello, triplets, right? So, I mean, you know, we're not in control of all these things, as much as we'd like to be. What about family schedule? How about how much do we spend our free time? Okay. Let's see, I got a clock in here. Uh, how much time do we spend together? Okay. How important is it to be on time? And then there's the family schedule and calendaring. If you're like my family and there's certain times of the year, you start going through the calendar and it gets a little dicey, but I'm a lucky guy because my wife said, look, for holidays, Shane, with my family, I just want three holidays and you can have the rest. We can spend Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter with my family, and you can have St. Patrick's Day and President's Day and Groundhog Day. It's fine. So it, it was just very generous. All right. I, I lied. I'm sorry. It, it does get a little more PG-13 here. We have expectations about bedtime. You know, every guy has definite ideas about what he wants his wife to wear to bed. But of course, she's thinking, he just wants me to be comfortable, right? Okay, well, then maybe something like this. Is that good? Oh, pink dinos. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. What about conflict resolution, which we're going to talk about next week? And there's so many things we could put in the box. We have preferences. We have personal styles of conflict or how to deal with conflict. Some of it healthy, some of it unhealthy. 
uh, when it comes to communication and conflict resolution, how do you work it through? How much do you talk about it? How do you talk about it? When do you talk about it? Do you avoid it? Do you yell about it? Do you ignore it? We all have expectations on how to handle conflict or to run away from conflict. We all have hopes and dreams. We all have expectations. All kinds of stuff in there. How to handle things, spoken or not, well-defined or not, expressed or not. Okay? How this life together is supposed to work as a married couple. Now, there's several things that impact this, and I mentioned, you know, what we've seen and heard, maybe what we've seen in culture, maybe how we grew up, but mostly, yes, it's what we experienced. I find that most of us have marriage expectations or thoughts about how marriage should be, think of it that way, a lot of times based on how my family of origin was, and I'm either trying to avoid something or recreate something. I'm not going to be like dad like this. Or I want to be like mom or like dad, and this, this was really good, and if you In a normal family, you've got some of both of that, probably. Okay? And so, here I go. I'm going to slip on the money. You know, even if we're trying to avoid something unhealthy, or if we're wanting to recreate something good that's healthy in a marriage that that we observed, we have these. Okay? This is my box. Okay? I'm going to put this one down. This is my box. All right? My hopes, my dreams, my desires, and honestly, they're my expectations. And if I'm not careful, I'll take my box of hopes and dreams and desires and I'll hand them to Carol, my wife, and say, here, make them come true. Here, this is how I want it. Please make them come true. Now, there's some problems with that. In my mind, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to fulfill my idea of what a wife is supposed to be. And I need you, Carol, to come through for me. You hear what happened just then? You hear how hopes and dreams and desires, which are fine, became a heavy expectation or a burden, almost a demand. And that's not a clear line, folks, and therein lies the problem. The struggle that you will experience the rest of your married life. How do I navigate this? When we hand someone our box of hopes and our dreams, our desires, it doesn't feel like hopes and dreams and desires to them if I'm saying, here, make it come true. It feels like this is what's expected of you. You are obligated to do this for me. A burden, a weight. It might feel like that if they don't meet those expectations, then they've broken the terms of some contract. And if you've already negotiated that and made it real clear, this is what I'd like, this is what I'd like, and maybe there's some fairness to that. Depends. I would say it depends on what it is, but like uh, in the spirit in which you're talking. But, but the thing is, is a lot of these things we haven't well thought out and well articulated. And then we surprise them, our spouse with them in the middle of a very heated argument at 2 a.m., right? But I wanted you to wear the pink pajamas, you know? But it's usually not that silly, right? It's, it's usually something pretty hurtful. So here's a key concept. Is marriage based on a contract or a covenant? In a contract, we keep score. In a covenant, it's a submission competition. In a contract, promises are conditional. In a covenant, our promises and our love and our responsibilities are unconditional. In a contract, I'm motivated by my desires and my needs. I put my needs first because I I make sure that contract has just what I require and need. A covenant desires mutual fulfillment, mutual satisfaction, and it actually puts the needs of the relationship first. And therefore, I would actually forego my needs if it helps the marriage or the family or the relationship or you you or my spouse. A contract has a price that allows you to buy out of it. A covenant in the context of Christian relationships acknowledges there is a great price that is paid for forgiveness and reconciliation. Whenever we're hurt or wrong, but that price is already paid. And a contract says, I will if you, dot, dot, dot. A covenant says, I will because Jesus. I will because God. Here's a better way to look at the box of expectations, a way to kind of frame it better. Whenever I put my expectations for happiness or fulfillment or how it's supposed to be on my spouse, I may be saying, you owe me this. Maybe I don't mean it that way, but sometimes that's what's in my heart. Especially if I feel like you've withheld something. You know, we're in the middle of some conflict. 
I'm handing my hopes and my dreams and desire. So I'm saying, you owe this to me. Be careful about that because they become those burdens and obligations. Because if we operate out of you owe me, then the debt of what you owe begins to choke out love. Agape, I'm choosing to love you better than I love myself love. Try this on for size. Here, honey, I've bought you flowers because it's Valentine's Day and I'm supposed to do it. I'm obligated to do this. That doesn't quite land, does it? If you're not sure, next guys, try it next Valentine's and see how that goes. Or for whatever the issue, I have fulfilled the terms of our contract on page 78, paragraph 3. I don't think that's it. That's not love, or at least it's a lessened kind of love. And now let me be real clear. We should do what's right. We do something sometimes because it's the right thing to do, whether I want to or not. I'm not talking about that. But if I'm meeting the wants and needs in your box, mainly because I'm expected to, because I'm obligated, because I'm, you're owed it. How long do you think I'm going to be able to do that well on the, my own strength and willpower? Do you really want to find out you know, if you're married to me, how long I can just on my own strength and willpower give you what you're owed? I'm not going to, I wish I could do it better, but I'm not going to last that long. So the little secret is that your spouse cannot fulfill all your hopes and your dreams, all these desires, even your needs. Your goal should not even be to have them meet all your needs. So here's a difficult to accept but amazing, beautiful truth about how to do marriage and relationships the way God intends. It's difficult because I'm a self-centered, selfish sinner. Let's say all that together. It's a good, it's a good time. I should have put on a slide. I did. I'm a self-centered, selfish sinner. Let's do it. I'm a self-centered, selfish sinner, but I'm saved by grace, and I'm being transformed by the Spirit into the likeness of Christ, and that's the key, because it's beautiful and it's amazing, because by the grace and the power of God, my marriage can be more fulfilling and more wonderful than I even imagined because of this. And let's just go to Scripture. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's amazing to me. I, I have to confess, I had never thought of that until I was working on this class earlier this year in, in the very specific context of marriage, that verse. I mean, we think of it in a general Christian sense, but read through those in the specific concept of marriage, and, 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 and I'm like, wow, that's a game changer. So what do we do with our hopes and our dreams and our desires, our expectations, if we're honest about them? Do we just pretend? What do we do with all this? Again, I'm not saying ignore it and pretend it's not there. Truth is, there's a lot of good things in your box. Some of these things are good godly things. A lot of them are just neutral, and it matters how you express them, right? And and, and what you do with them, like many things. But they're good, godly desires that God gave you in that box too. And and your spouse may not see it exactly the same. So what do you do? How do I keep this stuff here and and, and in the box, but well, say the box of of hopes and dreams and desires that I can express in an appropriate way and keep it out of this burdensome expectations that I'm laying on my wife, okay? How do we deal with our hopes and dreams and desires without creating the unhealthy expectations? on the one hand, or pretending they don't exist on the other. Uh, The best way to keep your hopes, dreams, and desires in the hopes, dreams, and desires box and out of the expectations box, the unhealthy expectations box, is to remember this about happy, healthy Christian couples. We owe each other everything, but we are not owed anything in return. It goes right with Philippians 2, what I just read. It makes no earthly sense, so I'll say it again. 
We owe each other everything, but we are not owed anything in return. That is Jesus, kingdom of God type of logic. That is the first shall be last type of, 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 of logic. Jesus put in John, you know, John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so love one another. So the question is, how has Jesus loved us? It's upside down from the me-centric, I must get my way values of the world. So Christ loved us by sacrificing for us and putting our needs above his own well-being. He calls us in the same kind of sacrificial, self-giving, covenantal relationship with one another. In fact, Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. This is all very biblical stuff. Easy to say. Tough to do. Because I don't want to sugarcoat it, folks. It's all fun with the, you know, the toys and all that, but there are things you're going to have, and if you've been married at least a few years, and you know, you've come up against things where there really are consequential things where your hopes, you know, my hopes, desires, dreams, expectations go counter in a, in a big way to my wife's or your husband's. You know? And it's a hard thing when that's unresolved. And like one of the myths I mentioned before, sometimes things don't resolve. Sometimes you can't resolve it or it's not yet. It might take a lifetime. That doesn't mean it has to be a life of misery, though. It means, though, that both of you have to be committed to doing it the Jesus way. And I am well aware that in some marriages, there is an unequalness where one person may not be interested in doing the Jesus way at all. And that's especially hard. So I'm not trying to sugarcoat that. But I am saying that no matter what situation we're in, how easy or hard, when we do things the Jesus way, we have God's power that comes and helps us. And it can be transformative for my heart. And I need to focus on that. And so you could say that in marriage, what you need to do is to begin a submission competition. And briefly, this is kind of an overview of what that looks like, okay? Uh, I I cover this a lot more in the whole class uh, in week one uh, of the class that we'll do. It's it's called Life Together, and it'll be in October. I can't remember the exact date. I should look up, but we'll we'll start registration for it because I cut it off at about 15 couples because we have some interactive time, and I don't want it to be a huge class. So look for that in September for the registrations for that. But, but a submission competition, you're going to examine your own expectations like we st- talked about. You're going to communicate needs and wants with love and respect. If you're not sure what that looks like or how to dig it, there's a great book by Emerson Egrich, and even on Right Now Media, if you're, you're, you're logged in there as a member here, uh, the love and respect study has got some really great food for thought on that, okay? Talk honestly about your hopes and your desires and your dreams. That's the thing. One of the best questions you can ask if you're willing, willing to do it for one another with grace and patience without pushing each other and pressuring each other is, hey, honey, what's in your box? Just if you're asking them to be honest, be willing to accept honesty. You know, that can be a little, little dicey, but, but it, the, we grow deeper in relationship when we are vulnerable, vulnerable with one another. Uh, you got to know the difference between requests and demands. We could do a whole long thing about that. And what is a request and how is it different from a demand? And guess what? I could do a whole long thing about it, but what that looks like in my marriage is probably different than what it looks like in your marriage. But there's a difference and you know it right away when I said it because you know that you're always giving your spouse requests and your, your spouse is always making demands, right? <laughs> no, but you, we, we often feel that way. So, you know, so it's like, I'm getting, and again, next week we're going to talk about fighting fair and conflict and how to work through some of that. But, but the, I know when it feels like a demand to me, and sometimes I need to coach my spouse, you know, maybe, I don't know if you, I'll assume the best. So maybe you didn't mean it that way, but that felt like a demand or like a pressure. Did you mean it that way? And she might go, yeah, you need to clean the yard. <laughs> you know? well, I don't know. But, you know, it, it may not even, I may not even be reading or right, you know, but it felt like a demand. It might be about what's inside me that made it feel like a demand. I don't know, but it might. I could give a request and she totally thinks it's a demand. And I could be giving a request that I think is a request, but if I really examine my heart, you're getting your back to your heart, and examining yourself. Maybe there's a little hidden demand in there. Have you ever done it? Have you been there? So that's a big one. And then think service and gratitude and discovery, not obligation. Change the 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 kind of the tenor of things and the, and the, and the atmosphere of things to be, I, we need to lean into serving one another, being grateful for one another, and even especially being grateful for the differences. And then the motivation is God's grace. Okay. So these are things we can cultivate. These are perspectives and skills we can grow and learn in. There could be a lot more, but I cover it more in the class. I just wanted to kind of 
point you in some thoughts there. Be patient with each other as you try these things. Have grace for one another. If you don't have grace for each other, none of this works. That's why I don't know how the world does it in relationships. Because if you don't have, the one thing Christianity brings to the world and the world of the most revolutionary idea that Jesus brings really is grace. Because no other religion has it like that. And the world doesn't have any grace for each other or for you or for me. But Jesus is calling us to extend the grace he gave me to my spouse and to others. And that's how this works. And you can ask then with patience and grace, what's in your box? Maybe you go on a date in the next few weeks and one day you may oh, go on two dates. And one day she gets to share, okay, here's some things, hopes and dreams that are in my box. And I'm going to start with some fun things. Then I might have one or two that I was like, yeah, these are, these are ones I have that are not getting fulfilled. I'm not saying you have to fulfill them all, but like, I want to talk about them. Okay. And then, then it's his turn. That would be an interesting exercise. So ask your spouse, then listen, then celebrate it. You ladies, you might be shocked. You might get mad. <laughs> That the guy has to ask, but let me ask you to have grace. We don't know what's in the box, always. Sure, we can guess some things. But even if you've been married a long time, your spouse can surprise you. You, She or he really can. Both of you need to lower your defenses and just talk honestly about clarifying your hopes and dreams without pressure. And it works if you sincerely and honestly are curious. That's the word I didn't put up there. What if you were curious about what's in your spouse's box and thought, I can have 10 more years, 20 more years, 30 more years, whatever, however more years we have, discovering what's in your box. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You would really grow towards one another. So be a less self person and cultivate a less self marriage paradigm. And this is how the gospel of Christ can transform our marriages. Happy couples put each other first by going first in an effort to be last. There's another way to put that. Deal with your marriage myths. Examine your own expectations. Begin that submission competition. And see marriage as a covenant, not a contract. Uh, I'll briefly just share. I, Ronnie shared this, I think, earlier this year, that, that story about the couple in uh, the Church of Christ in, in Talladega who, ha- who won the happy marriage contest and the good housekeeping thing. That was awesome. And I wrote it down because I thought it was so good because they said, here's how we have a happy marriage. We gave when we wanted to receive. We served when we wanted to feast. We listened when we wanted to talk. We submitted when we wanted to reign. We forgave when we wanted to remember. And we stayed when we wanted to leave. That's awesome. So next week, we're going to talk about conflict and what happens. How do we have a healthy perspective on and, and practice of conflict when these expectations or these wants and desires collide? Because sometimes they do. But I do want to leave you just real quick with some good ideas on what a marriage covenant promise can be. You took some vows when you married. Maybe you're asking this. Uh, this is a, a, a question I didn't answer. It, okay, Shane, you, you know, these, these unhealthy expectations, that the way they can become unhealthy. How is, what, what about the marriage vows, though? Didn't we promise some things? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And as I've come to see it, if I lean heavily into these principles and these attitudes, that I'm about to list, things like this, things that are similar to what's in your marriage vows usually. That's, if I lean into that over some super specific personal preference as my, what I want out of my spouse, right? Then, then it gets a lot healthier. It's the same way of Jesus saying, if you love God and love others, that covers a lot of stuff. Okay? So here's some marriage covenant promises. I will love you and not let go. After God, you will be my first priority. I will be faithful to you. We will work together to build a sturdy bond of trust. I promise to work through conflicts. I will bring energy to the quality of our marriage. We will work to protect our marriage. We commit to the practice of confession and forgiveness. We will encourage and build each other up. We'll deal with our differences with appreciation and grace. I will endeavor to love you like Jesus loves me, and I will continually learn how to love you better. That's really the key. I love what Tim Smith says, one of our elders, Tim and Kelly Smith. A lot of you know them. Ken, Tim says in marriage, my job in marriage is to get a PhD level degree in Kelly Smith studies. So get a PhD in your spouse studies, the study of your spouse, and learn what makes them tick. Learn how you can grow closer together. Marriage is a lifelong discovery, journey of discovery. Learn how to love your beloved well. 